When I look at music history, I think Pete Best is the biggest what if. Sure, we can point to any number of artists whose career was unfortunately cut super short by dying way too young, by mental health struggles, by any number of tragic accidents that might have happened. But with all of them, you can kind of think their career might have gone differently. Sure, it might be unlikely, but you know, maybe their next few albums all tanked. Maybe they just never reached that success that they had before. But with Pete Best, I think he's in the unique position of he knows exactly what would have happened had he stayed in the Beatles. And there's only four people who have ever known or ever will know what it was like to be a Beatle. And the Beatles were transcendent. They were the biggest band of all time. They were iconic. They were legends. They were any number of words you want to use. And there's only four people who have ever known what that was like. But Pete Best could have been one of those four. So I just got to thinking, what is it like? What is what is life like after you miss out on that opportunity that I'm sure most other musicians would kill to have? What happened to Pete Best after he was kicked out of the... Before we start talking about Pete Best, I don't often do this because I don't really, I'm not making these videos get super popular, but it is nice to hear if you appreciate them because there a lot of work goes into them. So if you like this video, give it a like, comment, tell me what you liked about it. If you didn't like it, I'm sure I don't have to tell you to comment, you're going to anyway because that's how YouTube works, but just let me know. It's nice to hear that feedback. So I'm sure if you're watching this, you're familiar with who Pete Best is and kind of like that major part of his story. But like me, you might not know what happened to him afterwards. So first, we're going to talk a little bit about Pete Best and where he came from and his time with the Beatles. Pete Best was born in 1941 in what was then British India. His mother was the granddaughter of an Irish soldier. And his father was a Marine who ended up dying in World War II. In 1945, with a new stepfather and a new young brother on board, the family officially left India and they landed in... Liverpool on Christmas Day of 1945. When Pete and his brother were younger, his mother decided to open up a coffee club in basically the family home basement. Coffee clubs were super important and super popular to the British culture at this time. I honestly could probably make a whole another video about the importance of coffee clubs in that whole culture. And Mona, Pete's mom, realized that really the only other major coffee club in Liverpool had a jazz only policy so her sons and her son's friends who were super into the kind of like golden age of rock and roll and r&b and that style of music didn't really have anywhere to go to listen to their own music the music they loved so she decided she would open up what she called the Caspaw club where they could come and they could play their own music and she would serve like candies and sodas and coffee behind like a little counter she had booked a band to play the opening night but for what whatever reason they weren't available so george harrison told her about this band called the quarrymen which at the time featured paul mccartney and john lennon and george harrison played in it as well so she booked them to play the opening night, but the club actually wasn't ready on opening night, so they had to go by and help decorate it. So John Lennon and Paul McCartney were painting the walls of the Casbah Club before they ended up opening it. That opening night had about 300 kids, which to me seems like the biggest bragging rights ever to say you were one of the 300 people who saw the Quarrymen open the Casbah Club. Like, that's an insane experience even though they probably weren't very musically good at that point it's just a watershed moment in music history they ended up doing well enough that mona offered them a residency so the quarrymen were playing pretty regularly at the cast ball club at the time pete best was playing drums in a band called the blackjacks he had kind of realized early on that he wanted to play music for a career that's what he wanted to do with his life so like many other kids in liverpool he was just kind of playing around in different bands and at the time he was with the blackjacks but the Blackjacks in 1960 officially broke up, and that's when Pete would make the decision that would change the rest of his life. Paul McCartney came to him. I'm sure Paul knew him just from the Liverpool music scene, from playing the Casbah Club. They were familiar with each other, and Paul knew Pete's drumming and the reputation it had. Pete was known for 
hitting the bass drum on all four beats, which really drove the rhythm forward, which is kind of what those bands wanted at the time. They wanted loud and driving and danceable. So, and they also knew that Pete was a hit with the ladies and he would bring in that female fan base. So Paul approached him and asked if he would like to join his band, which at that time was called The Beatles. The band, The Beatles, had just gotten a residency playing a club in Hamburg, Germany, and they knew that they kind of needed an official drummer before they moved down there to do that. They couldn't just keep using pickup drummers. They needed someone who was more committed and dedicated. Pete had actually done really well in school, and he was on his way to a teaching training program at a university. But knowing that he just wanted to make music with his life, he decided that he would you know, toss his lot in with the Beatles and see where that took him. And that should kind of be the end of the story, right? I should be able to say, and the rest is history, and have you guys know the Beatles, what the Beatles went on to do, and Pete Best is a part of that, and shouldn't really be more to it. But unfortunately, that's not really what happened with Pete. The decision to kick Pete out of the band varies depending on who you ask. If you ask Paul McCartney, his official version is that during their first recording sessions with their legendary producer, George Martin, George pulled Paul aside and told him that Pete's drumming just wasn't good enough and that they should think about replacing him. So Paul initially said that he was reluctant. He didn't want to just betray this person who had been through the rigors of playing in Germany with them and was presumably their friend. He didn't want to just betray him and be disloyal to him. But then Paul said at the same time he was young and this was their dream before them and so at some point they just realized we've got to try and make it work so a unanimous vote was taken and Pete was kicked out of the band but if you asked George Martin he said that's not what happened he said that while he did think that Pete wasn't a good enough drummer for the recordings and he wanted to use a session drummer for the recordings he recognized that Pete was a great drummer for a live band and that his pull with the audience was a super marketable thing so he suggested that they use a session drummer for the recordings to make those as good as they can, but that they keep Pete in the band to play live with them because he was such a fan favorite. So that whole comment has kind of led to speculation that the reason he was officially kicked out of the band was because of jealousy. I don't know if there's really anything to back that up, but it's one of the, the many rumors that float around about it. Uh, he was, as I said, he was the fan favorite. He was the one all the ladies were after. So the rumor goes that Paul and John, specifically Paul, got a little bit jealous and just decided to move on without him. But I think John Lennon's official, when he was asked his official reason for kicking out Pete, was that he was too slow. He didn't kind of keep up with their quick wit the way that Ringo did eventually. But Whatever the cause, Brian Epstein, who was the Beatles manager at the time, called Pete into his office, and Pete had no idea what it was about. He kind of started kind of cheerful, and then Brian told him that the boys had decided to move on without him. Uh, I don't think Brian loved that decision. I think he tried to talk them out of it, but he just thought the band chemistry was more important than keeping Pete in, so if the rest of them wanted it, then he would have to go through with it. And there's a story that while Pete was in Brian's office getting fired, Paul called uh, Brian and asked, is it done yet? And Brian had to say, I'm with Pete right now. And that was, yeah, you know, it's not where you want to be. I kind of feel bad for Brian at that time. Pete said that Brian told him the reason he was kicked out was because the band realized he just wasn't a good enough drummer, which Pete didn't believe because he said they had two years to learn he wasn't a good enough drummer. So like what was happening there but either way he was out of the band that's kind of the part of the story that i think most people know and it doesn't really go much farther than that you just think oh man poor guy and but no one really at least i never really stopped to think what happened to him after that like that's to be a beetle and just miss out on being a beetle is insane so like what what happened after that the initial thing that happened was that brian epstein offered to build a band around pete i think he recognized his draw in his appeal in that super popular Liverpool music scene so he offered to just build a band around him and then for whatever reason Pete declined that. Instead Pete joined a band called Lee Curtis and the All-Stars which was started by the Flannery brothers and some of their school friends. Pete joined them in 1962 and at that time they were actually one of the most popular bands in Liverpool. They placed second in a poll of Merseyside favorite 
bands mm-hmm. right behind the Beatles and right above a lot of other Liverpool bands that would go on to have a ton of success. So, you know, that it wasn't a bad band for Pete to join. They signed with Decca Records, released a couple singles that just really didn't go anywhere. And then the rest of the band decided to break off from Lee Curtis, whose real name was Peter Flannery, and become the original All-Stars and then eventually Pete Best and the All-Stars. Lee Curtis was actually on his way to some pretty good success. He had a decent following, especially in the German club scene, and he was just building up his profile. But unfortunately, in 1967, he got into a pretty bad accident that resulted in some like head injuries, and he ended up leaving the music industry entirely after that. Meanwhile, Pete and the All-Stars were going through some lineup changes, just kind of trying to figure some stuff out. They recorded a little bit more for Decca. They played in Hamburg, but by 1963, they were kind of realized that it wasn't happening and they split up after that pete decided to try his luck in the united states so he and a few friends went over to just tour the u.s and see if they could get anything going see if they could break into that major market of the u.s they called themselves alternatively the pete best four or the pete best combo or kind of some variation of pete in his name They recorded a little bit with some smaller labels, but never really got anything going, kind of like the All-Stars. Soon after that, the Pete Best combo, Pete Best 4, whatever you want to call it, broke up. And a couple of the members actually went on to be super popular songwriters and make a ton of money doing that in the United States. Meanwhile, Pete Best, after roughly 10 years of being a drummer, decided to officially retire from the music industry. He was just kind of like over the whole thing. In 1968, when Hunter Davies was writing the official authorized biography of the Beatles, he tried to get into contact with Pete to kind of get his side of the early days, and Pete was just not willing to talk about his time as a Beatle. The end of the 60s ended up being kind of a really difficult time for Pete, and that wasn't helped by the Beatles' attitude towards him. By this time, they were super popular, sparking the British invasion, selling out stadiums, playing whatever show they wanted. Whenever they talked about Pete at all, which wasn't a lot, they were kind of rude to him. They were saying things like John saying he was never really a Beatle, or uh, just kind of acting like he had no impact on their band or on their sound at all. Hunter Davies, the biography writer even said that when he brought up Pete it was just like blank stares like he had never impacted their lives at all and then all of this came to a head when the Beatles did a Playboy interview in 1965 and said that or at least heavily implied that Pete was always sick because he took too many pills Pete didn't love that and he ended up suing them for defamation and they settled out of court for a lot less than what Pete wanted. It kind of all resulted in Pete attempting suicide, but he was stopped by his mother and his brother who convinced him that he needed to live for his wife and for his new daughter. Pete had married a sales clerk named Kathy in 1963 after meeting her at a Beatles show. At the time of his attempt, they had one daughter, but they would eventually go on to have another one. After he retired from the music industry, Pete went on to have what I think most people would consider an extraordinarily ordinary life. You know, the kind of life that most people who aren't Beatles live. He first got work as a a delivery driver for a bakery making basically minimum wage and then became a civil servant in Liverpool for a while. He just kind of retreated into a a family-centric life and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I think a lot of people would look at Pete's life during that period and think, I mean, he's not a Beatle, he doesn't have millions of fans, he's not playing the talk shows, but, you know, you can have just as fulfilled a life just being a good dad, being a good husband, working to provide for your family. So, you know, I just want to stress that it's not the worst thing that could happen. I also want to note that Pete kind of very purposefully stepped out of the public eye during this time. He kept to himself. He was private, focusing on his family. So I've kept this to what he has said in interviews or written in his book afterwards. I I don't want to dig deep into this part of his life because he wanted it to be private. So that's why it's kind of sparse, but you know, I think that was what he wants, so I'm going to respect that. But in the 80s, Pete started to feel that itch to kind of play music again, which I think most musicians would understand. It never goes away. You always want to play. He had periodically been asked to participate in various Beatles-related shows, and he had turned down all of them. But the Beatles Fest in Liverpool in 1988, for some reason, he couldn't get out of. And he just thought, okay, I'll do this one show, and then I'll be done. 
but he played that show and his mother actually told him now nah, you're back in it like this is you're gonna keep going after this and she was right it also probably helped that this was well after the Beatles had broken up and a lot of them had publicly apologized for the way they treated him John in particular said that he was sorry for the way that he was fired they thought it was an immature way to handle it and uh I think the only one who never actually apologized for anything was Ringo because Ringo said, I have nothing to be sorry for, which is fair. Ringo wasn't part of the decision to kick him out. So, but I think that kind of maybe helped ease a little bit of the bitterness that Pete I'm sure felt around playing music. So Pete would start playing a few Beatles centric engagements and then formed the Pete Best Band, which toured all over the world. And he's still, well, I haven't seen any recent shows. I think he's struggling with some health stuff currently but at least like pre-COVID was playing all over the world and he was playing the same songs that the Beatles were playing in Germany and he said they still feel as fresh to him now as they did back then. In 1995, the surviving Beatles released an anthology which included some of the earliest recordings that featured Pete playing with the band. Paul claims that he called Pete and said that he had some money owed to him if he wanted to take it and then Pete took it So he did end up making some money off of the whole Beatles thing, but Pete denies that. He says that it wasn't Paul that called him. It was Neil Aspinall, who was the longtime Beatles road manager. Neil also actually lived with Pete and Mona for a time and had an affair with Mona and ended up having a son with her. So that's a whole weird relationship dynamic right there. But either way, he did end up making some money on the anthology, which is nice that his impact on the Beatles was actually recognized in some capacity. Pete says that he still doesn't know exactly why he was fired. He says that the only person that knows that information is Paul, and I don't see Paul ever talking about it, and it seems like the two still haven't reconciled, at least not personally. He says they haven't really spoken since the firing. Pete might not be known as a Beatle anymore, and I think a lot of people might see that as a tragic tale, but... He and Kathy are still married. They have two daughters. They have several grandchildren. He plays in a band that he loves all over the world. I mean, can you really do any better than that? 